So today we're going to talk a little bit about some tips that will help you to pass the reading SOL. Believe it or not, the reading SOL is usually the one that gives students the most trouble. Of the things that prevent people from passing advanced, it's the reading section, not the writing section, that oftentimes gets students. And I think one of the reasons why is because people assume, I can read, I'll be fine. But the reading SOL isn't just looking at your ability to read and understand. They want you to be able to do a little bit of analysis, which means that you have to be able to look at a passage and explain what the author is doing and why he or she is doing it. And that includes things like literary techniques and diction or word choice. So it goes beyond just reading the words on the page. You have to understand a little bit more about the art of reading. So let's talk about a few of the things that you can do to make sure that you pass that writing and reading SOL and get that exam exemption that most people want. One of the biggest and most important tricks is to make sure that you read the passages in their entirety, even the long ones. I know sometimes we want to skip over the passages, not really read them, maybe just even skim them, and just try to answer the questions that way. Keep in mind the people who designed the test are aware that a lot of people want to take that shortcut. So some of the questions are going to contain information that if you haven't read the passage, they're designed to specifically trip you up. So make sure that you actually read the passages before you try to answer the questions. Certainly, you can go back to review if you need to review something. So you don't have to memorize the passages. They'll be available for you to go back to take a look at. But do make sure that you're aware that there's a difference between reading which means that you're actually comprehending and reading, meaning you're looking at the words that are on the page. And believe me, sometimes we're so tired or exhausted or fed up that we simply look at the words on the page, but we don't actually think about what they're meaning. Make sure you read actively. Stop every few seconds and ask yourself, did I really get that? Did it make sense? If yes, then continue on. If not, make sure you go back and reread it. As you get ready to answer the questions themselves, make sure you read the question stem carefully. What is the question asking? Sometimes, for example, they'll ask you which one of these is the best. So there'll be two that could potentially be the answer, but they're asking you which of these two is the best. Sometimes they'll also give you question stems that say which of these is not. And if you haven't read the question carefully, you can easily miss a question. And again, those questions are ultimately going to be whether you pass the SOL or whether you have to retake all of these sections of the SOL over again. So it's worth it just to slow down and make sure you don't make any errors. So one of the things that I mentioned is that a number of the questions are phrased, which is the best? And by the best, they mean which one of these is the most relevant or useful? So here's a question from the spring SOL, and they said you do not have to actually read the passage to answer this question. Which fact from a magazine article would be best to include in a report about the literary career of William Faulkner? So again, all we're concerned about is the literary career. So by the time he entered eighth grade, he was increasingly truant. Does that have anything to do with his literary career? Nope, slash and trash. He worked as a clerk at First National Bank. Is that about his literary career? Nope. Shortly after entering the University of Mississippi, he won a $10 poetry prize. Okay, literary means books. We're talking about poetry. Bingo, that sounds like the answer, but let's check. He accepted a job as a postmaster at the University of Mississippi Post Office has nothing to do with literature, so your answer, of course, should be C. And again, as you're going through, make sure you're not making small little errors in your answers because those errors accrue, and ultimately, if you make too many of them, you won't pass this section. 
what, one of the things that the questions are going to ask you to do is to identify the meaning of words. Some of the meanings of the words and that they're going to give you are a little bit obscure. You may not have ever seen them. And that's okay because they're going to give you the tools that you need to answer these questions if you look carefully. So although they're going to ask you about words that might be unfamiliar, look for context clues. A context clue helps you to understand something even if you don't know the word itself. Types of context clues might define a word. So again, there might be a little a positive phrase or a little descriptor that defines a word, right? You might give an example to show what the word means, or you might offer an antonym or a contrast or a synonym, something that means the same. So when they ask you about these words, they are always going to provide you with the means to understand it. So don't just randomly guess, look for the clues that tell you how to interpret the word. Here's an example of a context clue using an example. Some singers are known for being bombastic. Kanye West, for example, constantly praises himself and stokes his own ego. So again, Kanye West is our example here. One of the big things that we know about Kanye, of course, is that he is a braggart and he has a big ego. And that, of course, is what the word bombastic means. So they've given you an example to trigger the meaning of that word. Even if you didn't know it, now you can figure it out. Here's another example. I have never met anyone as loquacious or talkative as she is. This is giving you a synonym, a word that means the same thing. So you might not have known the word loquacious. You might not have known how to say it. But again, just looking at this, you know that the word loquacious means talkative. Right? Here's an example of an antonym. She cannot be described as quiet. So again, we want a word that is the opposite of quiet. She is so loquacious. So again, you know that this has to be something that means loud or talkative because it's the opposite of quiet. Sometimes they'll also give you a full definition of a word if you look closely enough. I need to sanitize my tools in the autoclave a machine that cleans tools by baking them at temperatures high enough to kill germs. Well, again, you might not necessarily know what an autoclave is, but now you do. What is it? A machine that cleans tools. So they're always going to give you what you need if you look closely enough. And this is why I can't emphasize enough that you need to read the questions carefully and you need to read those passages carefully because they're giving you the information in there. Don't randomly guess. Don't guess haphazardly. The information is in there if you look closely enough. Here is an example of context clues. Ryan was meticulous with his writing assignments. Well, you might not know the word meticulous. The papers he turned in for English class received the highest grades for grammar because they never contained mistakes. So then meticulous means that they do not contain mistakes. So again, this means that somebody is not notably interested. It means no mistakes. Careful about the details. No mistakes. Yes. Cautious of consequences. No. Rational and reasonable, that is not the same as no mistakes. So your only choice by process of elimination is B, especially careful about details. And again, they tell you that with the example here. Meticulous means what? Right? Never contained mistakes. So read carefully as you go through the ones that ask you for context clues. Here's another example. You might not necessarily know the word sustenance, but if you don't, they provide examples that help you to answer this. The slender fish spends its day swimming through the honeycomb channels of the ice pack hunting krill, small crustaceans, for its sustenance. So the fish, right, is hunting these small crustaceans. Well, why would a fish hunt anything. 
obviously here sustenance means nourishment. It's hunting these things because it's going to kill and eat them. So again, we can figure out that it's not camouflage. You don't hunt for camouflage. You don't hunt for navigation. You could hunt for protection, but in this case, it doesn't make sense. Why would it hunt small crustaceans, right? So again, all of those things are ruled out simply by using the context clues. So read those carefully. Here's one more just to show you how much they're concerned with your skills at decoding. The ticket was inscribed with the logo for Kids Pop. The symphony orchestra's overt attempt to entice children away from video games and into the world of classical music, right? So, reading this, right, the ticket has this big logo on it. Why do you put a big logo on anything? To sell something or to draw attention. So again, the symphony orchestra wants to draw people away from video games and into classical music. So again, their logo is going to be big, right? So again, it's not meant to be adequate or for a limited time, and it certainly has nothing to do with price. When something is overt, it is clear or easy to recognize. So again, they put this big logo on there so that children could easily recognize kids pop, right? So as you look at these, Please be careful as you read. They are always going to give you what you need to decode if you look carefully enough. One more small example, and as I, you can see from the test, there are a lot of context clues on the exam. So again, just knowing that is going to help you immensely. So here's an example of a word used in concept, con, uh, context during the trip the mother remained pensive. She was absorbed in her own world and barely spoke to me. So again, when someone is absorbed in their own world and not talking to anyone, they're thinking about something, all right? So pensive means to think about something, all right? We also find out very quickly, I watched her play with the top button of her coat and thought about the man I was about to meet my father, whose face I knew only from a small black and white photograph. So again, the speaker has obviously never met the father, right? And the mother is playing with the button of her coat. Again, you play with things like a necklace or the button of your coat when you're nervous. Again, or you do it unconsciously, not even realizing it as you're thinking about something. So even if you didn't know that the word pensive means thinking about something, as you start looking at some of these other words being, why would someone be absorbed in his or her own world? Why would you play with the buttons of a coat, right? And again, all of those things will eventually lead you to the fact that this woman is deep in thought, and not only is she deep in thought about what's about to happen, she's also incredibly nervous. The last thing to mention about context clues and word derivation is that they're going to ask you about root words, which is the base of a word, prefixes, and a prefix is what comes before the root, and a suffix comes after. For example, you already know these things even if you don't remember what they're called. Prefixes are words like im, right? Im means not, right? So impossible means not possible. Inappropriate means not appropriate. So in is a prefix, right? Pro can be a prefix, right? like pro-choice. Over can be a prefix, like overdone, it's done too much. Underachiever, right? So they're gonna ask you about prefixes, what comes before, pre means before, and suffixes, what come after, and the root, which is generally that middle of the word. Don't be concerned if they ask you about, again, the root of a word. They're looking for you to see if there's a prefix, right, which there usually is, or a suffix, and just look at what's left of the word. 
A quick scan of St. Cyan's biography provided little assistance. The information was nearly incomprehensible to a beginner such as myself. Well, we already know that there's a prefix, in, right? In means not, right? Comprehend, right? And ibel means able. So comprehend is our root, right? To comprehend means to do what? Not to enjoy or listen or construct, but to understand. So incomprehensible is not understandable. And again, that makes sense because they give you a little help with this definition here with the person is a beginner. So again, a beginner is not able to understand what's present in this particular text. So don't be concerned if they ask you about root words. They mean the base of the word. Look for the prefix, and if there is a suffix, something at the end, and then what is left is the root. One of the other questions that they're going to ask you on this particular test is to look at a number of essays and examine how they are structured. How are the paragraphs arranged in the body specifically? Usually, papers are structured in one of a few ways. Sometimes you might have a cause and effect scenario where in one paragraph you set up the cause of something and then the effect. So maybe we look at something like global warming. So we look at global warming's cause and then in the next paragraph we might look at the effect. You can also set up things chronologically, right? Chronologically is looking at the order of things in time. Cron is actually a prefix there that means time. And so they're looking to see, for example, if you've got a narrative, does it develop someone's childhood, middle age, and elderly life? If so, that would be a chronological order. Essays can also be in comparison contrast format. So you'll compare things and then contrast them. So if I want to compare uh, a new iPhone with a new other kind of cell phone and ways that they're similar, and then in the next paragraph do the ways that they're different, that's comparison contrast. So they'll oftentimes ask you to look at these pieces and decide how they're structured or ordered. And those are all things to keep in mind as you're getting ready to take this portion of the test. At this time, I have a quick little worksheet that I'd like for you guys to look at and to go through the worksheet that covers the slides that we already have gone over. So go ahead and pause quickly and see if you can answer the first section, the one that's labeled Review Section 1. When you're finished, go ahead and unpause and continue on for the second half of remediation. One of the other questions that they're going to ask you about is types of writing and what those purposes of the, the different writing styles are. So one of the questions that they asked on this particular test was about expository writing. Expository essays explain something or they might try to define something. Expository writing seeks to do things like explain a process. So if I explained to somebody how to properly hit a baseball, including your stance in the batter's box, your grip on the bat, and your swing, that would be an expository essay in which I'm explaining. Or I could define something like steps for dealing with a fire drill. That would be expository. Narrative tells a story. So again, if it was a story of someone who won a great uh, award in a science fair and how excited she was at winning this particular award, that would be an example of a narrative. Persuasive writing tries to convince the audience of the rightness of a particular position. So if I wrote a persuasive essay about why downloading illegally should be punished, that would be a persuasive topic. 
Likewise, if I said that college athletes should be paid, that would be a persuasive kind of topic. Analytical writing is the last kind, and what it tries to do is to explain something. It's literally dissecting a piece. So if you analyze a commercial, for example, you might look at how it's being persuasive. What tools does it use? You might look at a literary work and look at the symbols. That's analytical. You're trying to explain the deeper meaning behind something. So analytical writing is different from expository. Expository is explaining something simple. Analytical writing really unpacks a text. It looks at how it's making meaning. So in the exam, they're going to ask you a number of questions about different writing styles and what the authors are doing with those different styles. This one is in a sample, but they ask you about what the paragraph is about. And then the very next question, they ask you that this is an example of what type, right? So Rachel stared at her watch in disbelief. It had been almost three hours since she had separated from her tour guide and the rest of the group. Let's meet at Grand Central Station, the main station here in New York at three o'clock, the guide had said. Now it was 3.30 and Rachel hadn't been able to find her group. Was she in the right place? She wanted to ask for help, but wasn't sure if anyone would be able to give her the information she needed. She watched the passerbyers and hoped that the tour guide was looking for her <coughs> too. Excuse me. So when we look at the paragraph, it's obvious that this paragraph is about a girl who's looking for her group. But going back to the different types of writing, what type of writing is it? If you guess that this particular type of writing was narrative, meaning it's telling a story, you're correct. That's exactly what it's doing. Is One of the ways that they're going to ask this question is to ask you to read a piece, and then they say things like, how can the reader best tell that this is an expository selection? What does expository writing do? Expository writing is the kind of writing that explains, right? So if we look at choice C, it reveals the author's stance on an issue. We can get rid of that immediately because it's persuasive, right? It presents a series of closely related facts. Well, that's not really what expository writing does. It offers a vivid description of ocean fish, right? And again, that's what expository writing does. It explains or presents or describes. It has nothing to do with the content that it's on fish rather than humans. I could write an expository section, uh, essay on, on humans as well. So it has nothing to do with the content. The idea is that expository writing describes something. So if I ask somebody to describe an artist, for example, so I want you to describe the music of uh, Lupe Fiasco. You would have to give me, right, the type of work that he does, that he's known for this, this, and this. And that would be an expository kind of essay. It describes something. The other largest section, other than context clues, is asking you questions about literary terms. Now, you guys have been doing literary terms since elementary school, and there are some of them that you just don't forget. You've been doing similes, comparison using like, as, or than for years, right? We hear them all the time. So again, her smile is like a string of pearls if she has really white teeth, right? Um, she is like an encyclopedia because she knows so much. That would be a simile. A metaphor is just a direct comparison, saying something is something, right? So again, if um, I say my pockets are a bank, right? That's a metaphor. There's no like, as, or than. Irony is a contrast between what you expect to happen and what actually happens. So it could be ironic if the guilty person in the movie is not the boy who looked sketchy, but rather the innocent looking grandmother. That would be ironic. It's a contrast between what's expected and what actually happens. A symbol is something that stands for something else. 
And there are some symbols that are really common, like sunrises that symbol a new day or a new beginning. In movies, oftentimes the first time you see the villain, he or she is either in the shadows or dressed in black because the color black represents evil. It is a symbol. It's something that stands for something else. So keep in mind, they're going to ask you to recognize and identify these literary terms. The problem comes that some of you guys can define them. You can tell me what a simile is all day long, but when you're asked to find one, you have a difficult time. One of the best things that you can do is as you're listening to your music, look for examples of similes in popular culture. So again, love you like a fat kid love cake is a simile, right? Look for different examples in your music of similes or metaphors, right? Irony. Uh, Eminem raps about irony a lot where he talks about how it's ironic that the more his celebrity status rose, the more people hated him. So again, it's ironic that when you achieve success, you get more haters. So again, that's an ironic thing. So an irony is a contrast between what you expect and what occurs. So again, wanting to be famous, finally getting it, and being unhappy is ironic. And again, lots of, of authors and writers incorporate symbols. Colors are oftentimes symbols. Blue can mean despair if it's a dark blue. Or again, sky blue usually means opportunity or hope. Some of the other literary terms that they're going to ask you about are things like alliteration which is the repetition of a consonant sound at the beginning of words, like Susie sells seashells by the seashore. That S is a consonant. For those of you guys that don't remember, consonants are your letters in the alphabet that are not vowels. Your vowels are A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. So consonant sounds at the beginning of words is alliteration. So seashells, seen at the seashore is alliteration, right? And you hear that in songs all the time, right? So look for examples in your songs of where you'd find that consonant sound at the beginning of words, right? Um, hyperbole is exaggeration. We use lots of hyperbole. So if you're exaggerating, saying I've got so much money, I uh, could finance a small country, that's hyperbole, exaggeration. You probably don't have that much money. So again, hyperbole is that extreme exaggeration. A flashback is going back in time to develop a character to explain something. So again, I might go back in time as an author to explain why a character is so mean or why a character feels the way that he does. So a flashback is kind of going back to an earlier time. Another word that they use on the SOL a lot is an analogy. It's a four-part comparison, saying something is to something as something is to something else. It compares the features of two or more things. So if I said day is to night as light is to dark, that's an analogy. It's creating a comparison. Figurative language is just the use of all of these kinds of things. Similes, metaphors, or other language that's not meant to be taken literally, right? When we say something like raise the roof, we don't actually mean like literally hold up the roof, right? It, or um, when you talk about like make some noise, there's a specific noise you're trying to elicit from the audience. So again, when we use figurative language, it's not meant to be taken literally. So when I say something like it's raining cats and dogs, I don't actually mean that there are felines falling from the sky, right? It's figurative. It's not meant to be taken literally. So when they ask you about figurative language, look for things that you couldn't translate if you were given like an alien to English dictionary. It wouldn't make sense, right? So figurative language could be things like she's not the smartest tool in the shed, right? Why are you talking about tools in a shed? Again, it's a comparison, but it's not meant to be taken literally. Other techniques that they oftentimes ask questions about are apostrophe. Now, an apostrophe in literature is different than an apostrophe in punctuation. 
an apostrophe in punctuation shows that you are leaving out a letter, like let's go to the store. You're saying let us go to the store, right? An apostrophe in literature is an address to somebody who can't reply back, right? So anytime you're addressing somebody who's absent or something that can't reply back. So if my computer malfunctions and I say, stupid computer, why won't you work? That's an apostrophe. Right? Tupac Shakur wrote a poem and a song in which he addresses, dear Mr. President. That's an apostrophe. The president is not going to say, well, hello, Tupac. How are you? That's an apostrophe, an address to something that won't reply back to you. In their song, Avenge Sevenfold sings, Dear God. And again, God is not going to come down and say, Why, hello, how are you? That's an apostrophe, something that can't reply back. Personification gives non-human things human qualities, saying things like the trees danced in the wind or uh, the uh, sun uh, blazed a trail through the sky. Um, those are all kinds of examples of personification. Tone is the author's attitude towards a subject. They're gonna ask you words like, are they critical, right? So are they critiquing something? Are they saying something is bad? Are they supportive? Are they optimistic? Are they happy, right, or positive? Are they pessimistic or negative? All of those are tone words. And you're familiar with tone because you have to think about the tone of voice that you use when you speak to people. If you are calm in your tone, if you are angry in your tone, disappointed in your tone, those are all things that can be communicated through words. So it's the author's attitude. And dialogue are the things that in text are put in quotation marks and they represent people speaking to one another. So again, in a story, if you have two people talking to one another, those exchanges are called dialogue. The last few that I wanna take a look at, and then we're gonna pause one more time to do a quick review of the terms. Onomatopoeia are your sound words. In Batman comic books, they use things like biff to represent when you get punched in the face. And again, if it t knocks the wind out of you, it kind of makes that sound. So again, onomatopoeia are your sound words. Connotation. The connotation is the meaning that a word suggests, right? It's not its dictionary definition. It's the meaning that a word suggests, right? So the word pig, if you look it up in a dictionary, the word pig is an animal that's in a barnyard that oinks. But pig has a lot of different connotations and they're usually negative, right? If you call someone a chauvinist pig, right? You mean that they're anti-women. If somebody is a pig, they might be a slob. If somebody is a pig, they might eat too much. Those are all examples of the connotations of words, the meaning that a word suggests. Recently, there was a song, and in the song, the artist says, I don't want no mediocre. Now, excusing his bad grammar, right? Mediocre and average mean the same thing, almost. But the word mediocre has a negative connotation. Average means just like everybody else. Mediocre means the same thing, but it's much more negative in its connotation. So the connotation is the meaning that a word suggests. Right? Again, make sure you know your root words. Again, when you take away the prefix and the suffix, what you're left with is the root. Imagery is your vivid mental picture. Point of view is the perspective from which the story is told. First person, Right? And the number one looks kind of like an I. First person uses the I pronoun. The speaker is an I character. I did this, I did that. First person can be limited, meaning you only know that person's thoughts. Or omniscient. Omniscient means all-knowing, where you know everybody's thoughts and feelings. Third person, the main speaker is a he or a she. Right? And in that particular uh, kind of perspective, the narrative can also be limited, meaning you only know one person's point of view, or omniscient, where you know everybody's perspective. And the theme 
is the message of a work. What is the point? A theme has to be a message of some kind. So technology is evil is a theme. Technology by itself is not a theme, that's a topic. So again, when they ask you about a theme, they're asking you what is the author's message? So think about those things and I'd like for you to look at the section labeled section two and do those exercises at this point. You not only need to know the definitions and to be able to identify these terms, you also have to think about why the author would use them. Similes can be used to compare something to something that people already know. So for example, if I say that uh, if the racers uh, went off like a gunshot, I have an idea of what a gunshot is like. Right? It starts loud and it's immediate. So that gives me a better idea or a better mental picture. Repetition can be used to draw emphasis. Right? If you repeat the same thing, right? In one of Amy Winehouse's songs, she says, no, no, no. She's adamant that she will not go. So no, no, no. That's repeated in order to add emphasis. Why are some of these techniques used? So here's an example. Now came a contrast in tempo. The lumbering sluggishness of giant tortoises painfully trudging along step by laborious step, right? So as we're looking at this, they want to know, right, why the tempo is sluggish like a giant tortoise. Now you get a pretty good image in your head. How fast does a giant tortoise painfully trudging go? obviously not very fast. So again, one of the things that this is doing is to indicate the sluggishness, the slowness of the tempo. And again, by describing it in a way that the audience can understand, you might not necessarily know anything about the tempo or cadence of music, but you can get a good indication when you're talking about a giant turtle trudging along. That's the slowness there. So to give that indication a little bit more resonance, to make it a little bit more evident, they talk about the slowness of those musicians. Here's another example. He swung wide around an anonymous heap of metal being swallowed by a greedy mound of blackberry brambles and came to an abrupt he swung wide around an anonymous heap of metal being swallowed by a greedy mound of blackberry brambles. Your first thing might be, okay, well that's an image. There's this heap of metal and again it's being swallowed up or overgrown by blackberry brambles, right? Well, the heap of metal is being swallowed by a mound of blackberry brambles being described as greedy. Blackberry brambles are inanimate objects. They don't have a mind of their own, so they can't be greedy. This is an example of what literary technique? If you said personification, you're right. Again, they can't be greedy, right? And again, they don't come to an abrupt halt. That's something that people do. Likewise, the swallowing is something that people do, not inanimate objects. So that would be personification. Here's an example of an analogy. An analogy, as we said, is that comparison, right? Comparison using four parts. Tezuka's manga may stand on the same library shelves as American superhero comic books, but Tezuka's manga are to most traditional American comic books what Shakespeare's plays are to soap operas on American television. So Tezuka's manga is being compared to American comic books, and it's saying it has the same relationship of Shakespeare's plays and soap operas. Well, what do you know about Shakespeare plays versus soap operas? Shakespeare obviously is much more sophisticated than soap operas. It has much better standing and status 
it's considered literature, whereas soap operas are not so much, right? So one of the things that it's doing by comparing something that you know, like Shakespeare's plays and soap operas, and the difference between them, it's emphasizing, of course, C, the literary merit of his manga, how good it is. It is like comparing Shakespeare to soap operas. One is much better than the other. He stopped as he drew near, huffing out of breath, right? Huffing, huffing out of breath. That noise is meant to imitate the sound of breathing at a rapid rate. So that one would be an example of onomatopoeia. It's imitating sound. So drip, drop, or bang went the weapon. Bang is trying to indicate that sound. So again, huffing is trying to indicate that when people get out of breath, that's kind of equivalent to the noise that they make. Here's one more. The days following tryouts for the wrestling team were a roller coaster ride for Ian. Obviously, that's not meant to be taken literally. When you look for figurative language, look for things that are not meant to be taken literally. The days are not equal oh, to a roller coaster ride. He had done his best at the tryouts and hoped the coaches would want him to wrestle on the varsity team. He worried over it for hours, right? So the purpose of the figurative language, describing it like a roller coaster ride, right? Why is it describing it in that fashion? So he hoped, right? He worried, he goes up and down in his thoughts, right? Part of the purpose of this is to describe it like a roller coaster ride of emotions. But you'll notice in this question, they don't point out where the figurative language is. You have to take a look in the sentence and find what is not meant to be taken literally. And again, it's this part here about the roller coaster ride. So keep in mind that not only do you need to know the definitions, you're also going to have to figure out which one of these is figurative language. Which literary device is used here? The fanfare and flourishes of the finale announced a farewell to our carnival. You can hear fanfare and flourishes of the finale and farewell. That's the uh, repetition of that initial consonant sound. So we have an example here of alliteration. So as we've gone over, they're going to ask you questions about things like context clues and root words. They're going to ask you questions about literary terms and their applications and why they would be used. They're going to ask you to read some passages and explain why the author is making the choices that he is. So these questions go beyond just general reading for comprehension. That's certainly a part of it, but not all of it. So as you go through, remember a couple of rules. Again, read the passages carefully. Make sure you read all the questions carefully and look for words like not or except or all of these except this one or each of these but this particular one. Look for those kinds of words in the question stem. Make sure if you're not sure that you go back and double check. You can go back and read the passages again or skim the passages again to get the answer. Don't just haphazardly guess. For the context clues ones, they're always going to give you the tools that you need to answer the questions correctly. What I'd like for you to do is in the final remaining portion, answer those end questions there in section three about passing the reading SOL. Again, good luck. I hope this helped. And again, keep in mind that you have to pass all three sections of this test in order to pass or to pass advanced. So make sure that as you're taking the test, you take your time, slash and trash, and again, make sure you read those passages and questions carefully.